guys, when everyone gets closer, can the guys, can y'all move those charts a little closer where they can see? They're kind of far away from the reporters. Kind of right in here. So what we'll do is uh, have uh, Director of Violence Reduction, Norm Kerr, Kerr, Norm Kerr, come up and speak. Then I'll come up after Norm and have a few comments. Then I'll take questions. Norm. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, my name is Norman Kerr. I'm the Director of the Office of Violence Reduction for the City of Chicago. And on behalf of the mayor, uh, we are very encouraged by the progress that we've seen so far this year. Uh, we know that traditionally we have very challenging summers in Chicago, and this year we've employed an all city and all government response. So that includes involving city departments, streets and sands, BACP, et cetera, libraries, parks, but also community-based organizations as well. So tapping into different arts programs, um, after school programs, street outreach programs, and getting them at the table. So we believe in the all hands on deck approach, and this is something that we're gonna continue throughout the summer, and we'll see what that yields. But I wanna turn it over to superintendent uh, to learn more about what's been happening. Thank you. Thanks, Norm. So for the weekend, there were 65 uh, victims uh, shot uh, over the weekend, Friday to Sunday, 65. <clears throat> That's a 27% decrease from last year's Father's Day weekend. So 65 victims shot over the weekend, which is a 27% decrease from last year's Father's Day weekend of who? 89 was shot over that week. 89, yeah. There were 10 victims who died from homicidal violence. 10. That's a 41% decrease from last year's 2020s victims of murder. 2020, 17 people were murdered over Father's Day's weekend. I'm gonna go through the shootings first. Shooting victims, 65, 27% decrease from 89 in 2020. 10 victims were murdered this Father's Day's weekend. There were 17 murdered 2020's Father's Day weekend. That's a 41% decrease. There were 172 guns recovered by Chicago police officers over the weekend. 172 guns recovered over this past weekend. That's a 102% increase over last Father's Day weekend. Numbers of guns recovered. So far this year for the year, there have been 5,546 guns recovered by Chicago police officers. That's a 25% increase from last year's guns recoveries at this point. And, and might I remind uh, everyone, every gun recovered by a Chicago police officer is a deadly force encounter. Also, every gun recover has the potential to reduce violence from firearms. And as Norm mentioned, we are executing a whole of government approach. Various city departments, street outreach, violence interrupters, and the Chicago Public Schools staff, all collaborating with Chicago Police Department in the 15 areas that we outlined uh, with very dense violence so that we can have the outcomes we are seeing. In addition, as we've 
discussed, Chicago Police Department is taking a big swing at community policing, community engagement. We're rolling out our community engagement programs as the city opens up from quarantine, focused on young people and others. So far this year, as you can see from these charts, murders are up 3%. Shootings are up 14%. That's a steady decline in both categories. But more importantly, month to month, June 2021 versus June 2020, murders are down 3%. and shootings are down 5%. Month to month, June 2021 versus June 2020, murders are down 3.5% and shootings are down 5.32%. And as you can see from uh, our weekly carjacking report here to my left, from the peak of carjackings in January of this year, there's been significant continued decreases in carjackings weekly in the city. And with that, I'll take questions. Whoever has the mic. Yeah. Uh, I'm Brandon Eisen with WBBM News Radio. And uh, many of the business owners, residents, and um, you know some employees that I spoke to over the past year um, talked about some of the curfews on businesses put in place, uh, say 10, 10 p.m., 12 p.m., 12 a.m., um, were causing uh, there to be limited eyes on the street um, past a certain hour. Do you see any correlation between more people being out on the street, um, besides the police presence, do you think that more people being out on the street till later is going to deter crime in any way? I think it's a little bit of a mixed bag. It depends on uh, a little bit one of those eye of the beholder. So I can understand businesses having the uh, concern that you know curfew uh, would deter some of their uh, foot traffic for their business and affect revenue. On the flip side, from a law enforcement perspective, uh, we uh, encourage uh, people who are traveling in well-traveled areas with a lot of people to always be aware of their surroundings. But as we know, as we get later into the night, uh, it's when we see spikes in violence uh, from uh, that midnight to 4 or 5 a.m. time frame where we start to see spikes in violence. And so, uh, there's, it's, it's a complex question you ask. Uh, we want to encourage, you know, foot traffic, business, revenue, that's good for the city. While at the same time, we want to be um, cognizant of, as we get into the early morning hours, 12 uh, midnight into 4 or 5 in the morning, uh, that you start having diminishing returns with more people out because of the increasing violence. Uh, you know, so it's a complex question, and it's, it's cleaner answers I can give you. You have a follow-up? Uh, I do. I do think that the way it was put to me is some of the crimes, say past midnight, were crimes of opportunity. Where, when there was increased foot traffic, there wasn't maybe someone getting singled out who was just walking down the sidewalk alone. Uh, where, when the bars were open late, there was tons of traffic out, tons of cab drivers, um, people were out there. But then, when all that went away. Um, someone who got caught maybe getting off work late at night and walking home through downtown or something, uh, it, there was, it was easier to victimize that person than, say, if a crowd of people were out on the street. So let's just use data to inform us on this. Go back before the quarantine and what happened between 12 and 4 a.m., and you'll find your answer. Because likely you'll find in the data uh, outside of 2020 up to this year's quarantine period that spikes in violence occurred 2019, 2018, 2017, 2016, as it relates to later into the night. Okay, so I, I'd like to be data driven on, on, my, on my information, and I, I would just point you toward that. While at the same time, again, I just wanna make sure uh, you utilize my full answer. It's a complex issue. Uh, we want businesses to thrive for the city. We want their revenues up. 
uh, and we want to encourage foot traffic to all of our businesses, uh, but we want to do it in a safe manner. Next question. Uh, Manny Ramos here with the Sun-Times. Um, today, Lori Lightfoot uh, asked reporters to dig a little deeper on a downtown police commander um, that was essentially, I guess, removed um, from his position or her position. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, I guess, what happened with that downtown commander? She alluded to maybe something bad or nefarious happened on his watch. Is there any information you can provide on that? Uh, we don't discuss personal issues. Do you have another question? Uh, I, I do, but I can pass it along anyway. Okay. Will Jones from ABC7. Can yep. you tell us any more information on what happened in Humboldt Park at the Puerto Rican Day Parade and any other information about the stabbing of the woman on Wacker? Right, and then we'll do a third one on the fifth victim of Inglewood as well. So we'll do all three. Brenda, you want to just update on those three? Thanks. Oh, there you go, Brenda. <clears throat> How you doing? So first we'll uh, do the, the Humboldt Park one. So I know that there's video out there already that shows, you know, several offenders dragging a victim out of a, of a car and beating her. So what we know right now, and the detectives are still investigating, is there was a very minor traffic accident and then a group of people swarmed that specific car and they are seen uh, hitting and beating the woman who's the driver of the vehicle and then eventually dragging her out. What the video doesn't show is there was a, a shot discharged at some point and you can't see it in the video and that's, it appears when the female gets struck and then the, the male comes out um, and he's almost on top of her and then you see that second suspect clearly just holding a gun shooting him in the head almost execution style. So that's what we know so far. The detectives are working the investigation looking to identify those specific uh, people that were surrounding the car and striking the woman, and then obviously the individual who takes the gun out and then shoots the male in the head. So it's an ongoing investigation, and um, you know the video, once again, doesn't show everything, um, but those are the facts that we're looking at right now. Uh, and then the second one you asked about was uh, the female who got stabbed downtown, correct? So uh, same thing, I know there was a lot of video that, that was out there already, uh, but detectives are investigating. Uh, we still have uh, a witness who's cooperating with us. We are seeking the identity and then the eventual arrest of the person who stabbed that female. So it's an open, active investigation, um, and we're looking to identify and then obviously uh, arrest that individual. I think the superintendent mentioned lastly, unfortunately, we did have a fifth person die from the Inglewood shooting that happened the, the week prior where four people uh, were shot inside that residence. The fifth person has now expired. And also a pretty active investigation from the detective's uh, standpoint. I don't wanna give a lot of information on that because some of it is uh, speculation, but the detectives are investigating. They have uh, you know, a basically a pretty good investigative plan and idea who may have done the shooting in that in inside that residence. Um, but due to the fact that it's an inside crime scene, not a lot of witnesses, we still have a, a lot more to do to move forward on that, um, but we're definitely, we're definitely moving forward in the right direction. If I could follow up on the humble Park about that video that is on social media, this is for you, Superintendent. Okay. What does that do to the image of the city? I mean, this is going on, I've been, people have been sending me this across the country. What does a video like this say about the city of Chicago and are you worried about the image as we head towards summer? So one of the things that uh, you don't need to do with this particular circumstance is sensationalize it any more than it's already sensationalized. But I would like to put all of this in context of the countries under a violent crime wave. Uh, but as you see and heard from uh, my initial statements, uh, there is a decline in both homicides and shootings in this city which is particularly unusual if you look at the other major cities in the country seeing a continued peaking of violent crime. When you're seeing Chicago peak in January, as you can see from the charts, and steadily decline in both murders and shootings each month, with some fits and starts uh, throughout the first quarter of this year, but the second quarter of this year has shown a steady continued decline in both murders and shootings, but for the extraordinary uh, either multiple people shot and killed or the incident caught on video, uh, an extraordinary event where you actually see uh, this tragedy happen uh, real time on video, people posting uh, the night of, moments after, uh, really adding to 
uh, this tragedy for all of the families of the victims involved. Uh, but for those circumstances and the advent of it being, uh, the capability of it being uh, promoted on social media, shown on social media, um, gives the sense that this is a, an unusual circumstances in the city of Chicago when, as you can see from the chart, from a historical perspective, and not even so far back, uh, 900 murders in Chicago in a single year. Uh, 700 murders in Chicago in a single year. Um, and we are not trending toward any of those numbers. We're actually, uh, with our whole of government approach, have started to bend the curve of violence in this city. Uh, but for those sensational incidents, those tragic, you know, real time shown to people where before the advent of social media and maybe the 24 hour news cycle uh, that we currently have in this country, you know, the year we had 900 and I believe it was 970 murders in one year in 1974, another 940 murders in 1991, 939 murders in 1992. Uh, but for the advent of social media during that time, uh, do we look at today and say, this is something I haven't ever seen, which is true because social media didn't exist, nor did a 24 hour news cycle exist. But every crime, every crime, is one too many for us on the Chicago Police Department. Every one crime is one too many. And the fact that there's violent crime happening like the one you are referring to gives us all on the Chicago Police Department a, a sense of urgency to risk our lives, to take more guns off the street each and every year. We're on pace to have over 12,000 guns taken off the streets of Chicago each and every one of those 12,000 guns we forecast to take off the streets of Chicago is a potential life saved. And it is a deadly force encounter that our officers are willing to take each and every day with last year's 500% increase in officers shot at and shot in this city. And we are on a faster pace of officers shot at or shot this year than we had last year's 500% increase in officers shot at and shot, risking their lives and the concern for their family for their lives each and every day, working long hours, day in, day out, uh, with canceled days off uh, on these particularly violent weekends, uh, doing everything they can. That's the message to Chicago, that the Chicago Police Department is there for you, willing to risk their own lives for the safety of the people of this city. That's the message. Yes. Good afternoon, Amy Jacobson, WIND. Sticking on the topic of exhausted police officers, how long are the 12-hour shifts, no days off, going to last? Because yesterday was Father's Day. A lot of people wanted to be with their family members. And as we all know, no exhausted cop is a good cop out on the streets. So a little bit of your premises uh, to that question is, is I want to correct the record. So we are trending 28% below the number of amount of overtime we spent last year. So we are utilizing officers on extended shift less than we have last year and in the recent past. So we're doing this strategically uh, when there are violent weekends. But I would argue this point. Some officers come into work on those violent weekends. Whether you extend shifts or not, whether you cancel days off, officers, we don't have bankers hours. So officers are coming to work. And I'm worried about the officers who come to work with not enough officers at work. What about them and their families? And would you rather have more officers at work doing violent weekends for officer safety or less? And the real question you're asking is, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my sister's keeper? When it's very violent on the weekends, Will you support your brothers and sisters in law enforcement who have to come to work those days? We'd rather have more officers at work for officer safety than we have less, particularly during attacks on police being at the highest level we've seen on record. I'd rather have safe officers, officers who go home to their families, than less officers at work and less safe officers. Now, I would add this feature to what we've done recently. We work with our peer support staff, our EAP staff, 
Uh, Dr. Sobo is uh, one of our clinicians who heads the 13 clinicians as well as the peer support, along with Alexa James. We identified um, respite areas for our officers over this uh, past weekend where more breaks were given to officers. We integrated uh, services for officer wellness into those breaks where officers got for the first time an opportunity to talk with a peer support person or a clinician during that time. We did not deploy our peer support officers. We used them uh, in the break areas uh, to provide support for their brothers and sisters in blue uh, who obviously are working, as you mentioned, uh, long hours, but less than they have last year or the year before or the year before. A 28% decrease in the amount of overtime uh, that we're utilizing. And so we'll uh, obviously use it again uh, during uh, the 4th of July weekend, uh, which particularly has challenges, uh, predictably more violent, as well as Labor Day weekend, which is, again, predictably more violent, uh, as we have seen for Memorial Day weekend and this past Father's Day weekend. So think about the cadence of overtime. It's Memorial Day weekend, it's Father's Day weekend, it's 4th of July weekend, and it's Labor Day weekend. So out of the 52 weeks of the year, we're asking officers to support their brothers and sisters who have to come to work during the predictably, predictably more violent days of the week and not leave them out there without enough cover for four weekends out of the 52 weeks, weekends in a year. That's what we're asking. And, and officers have stepped up to the challenge without question. They are supporting their brothers and sisters, a 102% increase in guns recovered over this past weekend compared to last year. So officers are stepped up to the challenge despite the critics of this. I would rather have more officers here doing violent weekends than fewer for the officers who have to come to work every day. We are our brothers and sisters keeper. We are. One more quick question. Um, I feel like the right hand's not talking to the left hand. If you, you know, look right now, there's 92 people who've been charged with first degree murder who are out on electronic monitoring. I know that's not your, that's the judge's decision and then Tom Dark, Cook County Sheriff has to oversee it. But have you ever thought about having a sit down with Kim Fox and Judge Evans to talk about electronic monitoring? Because we know there's a lot of repeat offenders who strike again when they're out on an ankle bracelet. So we have. We hadn't just thought about it. We've done it multiple times, sat down with all of the parties you mentioned involved multiple times. We plan on sitting down more. Um, and, What's and it's, accomplished? It, it's, it's, it's this issue. And it starts with the failure of mass incarceration. That's what this issue is. And likely the overreach in correcting it to the point that violent offenders, like you mentioned, over 90 people charged with murder out back in the communities on electronic monitoring. Uh, we, we argue against violent offenders being the correction for mass incarceration in the 80s and 90s. We argue against that. We argue for uh, this activism amongst the courts when it comes to low-level offenders, maybe first-time offenders, uh, likely people who need drug treatment and or mental health treatment for low-level property crime. We argue for violent offenders being held accountable for their actions and have significant consequences in the courts uh, to the point where they protect the community. That those consequences, meaning there are some people who are violent such that they need to be in jail to protect all of us. And that's what we argue for. So we, we're splitting this argument saying, yes, mass incarceration was wrong. We're not advocating for more mass incarceration, particularly of black and brown people, people that look like me. I'm not arguing for that. I'm arguing against um, less consequences for violent offenders, like people charged with murder. Those people need to be in jail to protect all of us, is my argument. And you can still uh, have an impact on black and brown people getting a second chance who are either first-time offenders or low-level offenders or likely addicted to uh, whatever drug or alcohol and get treatment as a part of their release. But violent offenders need to be held accountable to the highest consequent, consequence that the law provides. Full stop. Put a period right there. 
yeah. uh, the uh, shooting in Inglewood, the officer, I guess a police officer, owned the building and he's been stripped of his police powers. Can you say why or was it, or, or can you say, was it something independent of the shooting or is it tied to his ownership of the building? It's, it's multiple reasons that we're not at liberty to discuss because it's uh, on, under investigation. Is, there, is it tied to this ownership of the building at all? We're not at liberty to discuss because this incident, this officer is under investigation for this incident. For the, it's, yes. it's tied to this incident? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, Superintendent Christian Farm, BC5, just you may want to have the chief uh, get into this. Humboldt Park again. Okay. In terms on, of Brandon. just, is, it, is, it gang, is there any gang issue with this at all? Brendan, any, um, there was also a question about this being a carjacking, but you talked about it being some sort of uh, maybe road rage or accident issue. Can you just clarify that a little bit for us? Sure. So uh, obviously we don't have the suspects identified yet. Um, and the, uh, you know, the, the male is deceased and the, the female is really just hanging on in extremely critical condition. So I can't give you the exact motive, but based upon, you know, what we saw and what you guys are seeing in the video, it doesn't appear to be a carjacking, okay? There's a lot of people on the street. They're going up and down the street in their cars very slowly. It, it appears to be a very minor traffic accident and then the car gets swarmed. So if something happened before or after that we don't know yet, you know, what was somebody maybe pointed a gun or something, we don't, so we don't know what we don't know yet. But it doesn't appear to be a carjacking, it appears to be a very minor traffic accident, which leads to this, like this beating of the woman. So our gangs involved, once again, don't have the offenders identified, uh, but it doesn't seem to be gang related. It doesn't appear at this time, and once again, the motives could change, but it doesn't appear that, you know, one gang's flashing gang signs, and that's the reason for the attack, that it seems like there's a minor traffic accident, and then things explode very quickly. Thank you. Any last question before we, okay, last question. Uh, so this is kind of a softball question, but it's in response to uh, kind of mixed reaction to uh, a picture posted over the weekend on social media by CPD, uh, and it got mixed reaction of praise and criticism, but uh, two officers outside Wrigley Field with uh, what looks like kind of like assault type rifles. Um, when, when you have this type of police presence, do you have something locked and loaded to, for parents to say, or what would you say to a five-year-old child going to a Cubs game and seeing this type of presence? Police officers are doing everything they can to protect you and have a good day at the, at the baseball game. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Can you ask, uh, answer the question about the commander that was reassigned? Because there was allegations that he was reassigned because he wouldn't put a SUV car in front of your favorite restaurant. Is that a rumor? So I don't have a favorite restaurant yet. That one's not the favorite. Uh, I don't eat steak. Uh, I'm partial to salmon. Well done. Blackened. Thank you. Thank you.